Modular Medical has developed new low-cost, easy-to-use insulin pump that is potentially very disruptive to the current market where high-cost and complex insulin pumps keep many users away. Modular has a potential not to just take market share, but to substantially increase the size of this multi-billion dollar market by addressing the unmet needs of thousands and thousands of diabetics. I'm Martin Gago with Market Radius Research. It's Tuesday, May the 7th. Please remember this is neither a recommendation nor investment advice. We're here to learn about the company. Jeb, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I first met your story six months ago or so, and you've hit a bunch of milestones, and uh, your products are uh, in the hands or back and forth with the FDA. So right. I'd love you to introduce yourself and tell us about Modular Medical and the opportunity you have in front of you. Great. Okay. Thanks for having me, Martin. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm Jeb Besser. I'm the CEO of Modular Medical. We're a development stage uh, medical device company focused on developing a next generation insulin pump. Um, let's, let's skip quickly to, hold on. There we go. All right. So we're listed on the NASDAQ under the ticker MODD. We submitted our device to the FDA for clearance on January 19th, 2024. We're headquartered in San Diego and our initial target market is over $3 billion. And we were founded by Paul DePerna, who was the founder, first employee, CEO, original CEO, and general guy behind Tandem Diabetes, ticker DN TNDM, which believe it or not, even though their device was cleared in late 2010, was the last major entrant, successful entrant into the insulin pump space. So it's been 13 years since someone has gained serious traction and made a run at this. And we'd like, we think that in order to in order to get into this space, you have to be a little different and you have to do things differently. So the first question people usually ask me is, why is there an opportunity here when you have $3 billion plus gorillas already in the space and you're just some little company? Well, it is true. Medtronic, Tandem, and Insulate have been in this space since 1996, 2009, and 2010, 11, respectively. Um, and in order to understand why there's an opportunity, you first have to understand what is an insulin pump and why does it actually benefit you? Because insulin pumps for 99.9% .9 of people who are people who require daily injections of insulin are always better care than needles and strips. And the reason is very simple because an insulin pump gives you two things that a needle can never give you. The first is a slow basal drip all day long that accounts for roughly half your insulin, which simulates what your pancreas would do for you if you're not a person with diabetes. And the second thing is, that you can, by pushing a button discreetly through your clothing, you bolus more frequently and in smaller amounts. And when you do that, you stay closer to baseline rather than skipping boluses around meals or at times where you're starting to go high or low. And we know that the long-term damage from diabetes over 15 or 20 years comes from these massive excursions from baseline that either happen because of your own behavior or because of the lack of, or the lack of treatment or the nature of multiple daily injections, which are which do not simulate the natural state of affairs very well. So insulin pumps are good quality of care and they save the system a ton of money. If you go on an insulin pump, it saves an insurer $10,000 a year fully loaded, including the a $5,000 placeholder for the cost of a pump. So you would think the insurance companies would be all over pushing these products, but they are not. They make it very hard for you to go on a pump because they are worried that the current pumps are too costly, too complex and too cumbersome in terms of their form factor in multiple ways in or and they're going to buy you a four thousand dollar paperweight that you will not use and so they make it hard for you to go on a pump even though there are major savings if they can get you to go on one and and look to some extent they're right because pumps the penetration of insulin pumps for in type 1 diabetes was 32 percent in 2006 today it's about 35. It's been almost 20 years and there hasn't been a major movement in, in share there. Now in type two, it's gone from zero to about eight or 9%. But the reality is eight out of 10 people who would benefit from being on an insulin pump are not on an insulin pump. And the people that have gone on pumps are the people who save the system the least amount of money because they're so organized, so diligent, and so motivated that they're willing to spend the 30 to 60 minutes a day it takes to manage one of the current pumps. And you can see it in the last statistic on this slide. 2006, 21% of type 1s were making their ADA targets. Today, it's the same number. 
You can get great care with the current pumps if you're willing to put in the time and effort. And I applaud you for doing it, but that's not everyone. The simplest analogy in this space is some people make a cup of coffee with the $2,000 latte machine that they put on their kitchen counter with a forklift. But most people have a Keurig because it's 80 to 90% of the benefit for 10% of the work. And that does not exist in the insulin pump space today. So, okay. Interesting thesis, but it doesn't have any legs to it. So the first pushback I usually get is, well, Jeb, the reason that there isn't more penetration of insulin pumps is that most users won't wear anything at all. They just refuse to have something on their body all the time to get better control of their diabetes. And the problem with that thesis is that there's another device, a continuous glucose monitor that is worn all the time in order to get better results with your diabetes that happens to be now, since I made this slide, four times as penetrated in the market as pumps. So they are willing to wear something, they're just not willing to wear pumps. Why? What's so different about the CGM space versus the pump space? And we would say it's this. In 2016, Abbott introduced a product called the Abbott Freestyle Libre into the continuous glucose monitor space. Dexcom had come into the space in 2010 and it cleaned everyone else's clock. They were the dominant player. They had the best form factor. They had the best accuracy. And all the key opinion leaders in this space said, why does anyone want this crappy version of Dexcom? because the Libre was less accurate. It didn't give you a real-time feed. You had to run, swipe a wand over it in order to get a number. It didn't require a finger stick to calibrate, but as a result, it was much less accurate. It didn't have all the real-time alarms. It didn't have a patient portal so your family could see how you were doing on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. And despite all of those issues, within five years, Libre had as many users and was doing as much revenue as Dexcom. But Dexcom kept growing too because they're totally different audiences. The Dexcom audience looks a lot like the people who use the current three pumps on the market. I work hard. I get better results. I like all the sophistication. I like the alarms. I like to know what's going on on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. The Freestyle Libre users, when we surveyed them, said things like, I like this product because it makes my life easier. I don't have to prick my finger, bleed on a strip, and then look at the results. All I want to do is swipe the wand and know my number when I, when I want to know my number, and that is it. I don't want the finger stick to calibrate in the morning because that's one more thing I have to do to manage my diabetes. I don't want the patient portal because then my family will yell at me for what I ate for lunch, and I don't want all the alarms because people judge me for being a person with diabetes when those alarms go off. So... We think that the Libre users, now that they've had the product for five years, are coming back to their endocrinologist and saying, I see how bad my numbers are. I want to do better. But it's really hard. But what do you have for me that isn't one of the current three products? Because I've been looking at those for 13 years, and I have friends who are on them, and I'm not doing that. What do you have for me that's different? And to date, the answer has been, I don't have anything for you. Work harder. Try harder. <laughs> Be more tech savvy. So. Do the doctors agree with this thesis? Then we surveyed 10% of the endocrinologists and nurse diabetes educators in the US who see patients and asked them, would, how many of your current multiple daily injectors, and this is critical, not your current pump users. We're not trying to go out and convert people who are already happy with their pump and familiar with the interface and have taken the week of training and put down $1,000 to buy a pump. We're not trying to convert them to our product. We're trying to convert people who are currently on a le much less effective standard of care. Okay, so what percentage of your multiple daily injectors that you see on a regular basis would you put on a pump that was easier to use, less training burden, less costly, less full feature? And they said one in four, and that is how we size our initial $3 billion market. But they don't just say one in four. When we survey them, they literally start listing off 10 to 20 patients that they see on a monthly or bi-monthly basis who come into their practice who have raised their hand and said, I want a pump, but, and that but might be any number of things. It's usually a combination of things. Um, one of the leading nurse diabetes educators in the United States told me, you know, when someone says they want to go on a pump, I ask them to pull out their cell phone. And if what comes out of their pocket is an early model smartphone or a flip phone, I say not to channel Jack Nicholson, you can't handle a pump. And look, that's if you've ever tried to teach a relative, a friend, a parent how to use technology that they're not up for, you can understand that it would be very hard to motivate a nurse to and pay them enough to make that worth their while, given how complex the current products are. So then we asked thousands of patients, would you ever go on a pump? 
And 45% of them said, yes, I would go on a pump. These are multiple daily injectors too, by the way, not pump users. They, but they said, you have to make it easy for me to learn, easy for my doctor to prescribe, easy to get reimbursement. And the bottom line is, if it's more than 10 minutes a day for me to manage, I'm not doing it no matter what, because I'm already so overburdened by my disease. Just like the Keurig, you have to bring the product to the customer. And that hasn't been done in this space because the current solutions were designed a long, long time ago by engineers for engineers and the tech savvy. Brilliant engineering solutions to a problem a long time ago. All right. So what did we do to what do we do to change this? So this is this is our product, the mod one, insulin delivery for almost pumpers. And then we tried to capture in terms of usability, as many of the features that people complained about with the current pumps as we possibly could and address those issues. So issue number one, I don't want to have to carry a second device around or use a complex interface. So we have a simple button. Everything you need to do with our product, you can do with the button. There's going to be an app on your phone that will tell you, yeah, I'm getting, you know, I just bolus myself. I probably don't want to do that again, or the product is on, but everything you need to do, you can do with a button, no cell phone required. Um, and if you look at the insulin Omnipod, a cell phone is absolutely required. It will not work without it. Um, also, no external, so no external controller. I can do everything with the button. I don't want to change batteries. Current products, you have to change the, like Medtronic, you have to carry around AA batteries. Tandem, you have to charge it while it's on your body at night. Insulet, it doesn't work unless that second lockdown cell phone that you have is charged up. And unlike the insulin Omnipod, our product is removable. If you put an insulin Omnipod, which is the current market share leader who's taking share hand over fist right now, if you put it on, once you fire that clever little auto injector and you leave that needle, then and it leaves it, you put in the needle and then it leaves that soft cannula, you can never fire it again. If you take it off, it's garbage. And so is all the insulin inside. If you knock it off on a door frame, it's garbage. If you decide I'm going to take this off because I don't want to talk about my diabetes on a date, it's garbage. So removability, lack of charge, no need to charge. Our battery is built into the three-day cartridge, and we're reusing the electronics. And Omnipod, you're throwing away, even though it's a very desirable form factor, you're throwing away all the electronics every three days. And the electronics are expensive. So by click by using a two-part pump where you click it together with the complexity of McDonald's Happy Meal every three days, and then you just replace the cartridge, you get to use those electronics for 90 days instead of three. That's an enormous cost savings. But unlike the Freestyle Libre, we're not asking you to sacrifice accuracy for simplicity. We are just as accurate as the leading pumps. In fact, we might even be the safest pump on the market if we're cleared because we pump in a totally different way than they do. We pump with negative pressure. And the FDA considers failing open to be the biggest risk with these products. So much of a risk that they will not allow a human trial. You have to do a usability trial where you don't actually pump insulin, but they won't allow you to put a pump on a human being until it's cleared. Because if a pump fails and that three mLs of insulin goes into your body, you're dead in a couple minutes. So no comebacks. You have to, you have to make sure that the pump cannot fail open. And you have to pump at smaller than a 200th of a drop with 5% accuracy approximately. Um, and you have to do it all without agitating the mixture too much because the main preserve of insulin is zinc-based, even though you're buying the insulin separately and putting it into the device. And the other preservatives in insulin leach into most kinds of plastics. You have to be super careful of your choice of materials. This is a very, very complex problem to try and solve. Oh, and, and before I forget, the other major difference between us and the Insulin Omnipod is because they have all this hardware inside that uh, that was designed a long time ago and requires a lot of power, and they have this auto injector, they can only hold two mLs of insulin. And while their form factor is very desirable, 25% of all type 1s and 65% of all type 2s can't get through three days on, three, on two mLs. They need three, like the other two products have. So if you want a patch pump that has three mLs, if we're cleared, we would be the only option on the market. When you said it, your pump works by negative pressure, could you just <clears throat> explain a bit what that means and, and what so, so what what that means? So the current the current pumps the current pumps all drive a syringe into a reservoir, they pull it out, and then they rotate a finely machined cam every five minutes in order to pump insulin. The way our pump works is that we um, we gradually agitate the mixture using a very, very slow motor, but we're pulsing every 30 seconds and we use an air pressure sensor to sense what's left in the reservoir. None of the current pumps actually sense what's left in the reservoir directly. They're like driving a car without a gas gauge. And so 
The way they get their accuracy is by finely machining the cam. And when you hear finely machined, you should think costly. And what that also means is that if we fail, because we're pumping with negative pressure by venting by venting the uh, reservoir and then and then detecting what's left in it if there's a failure it actually creates negative pressure meaning that it pulls insulin away from the patient out of the cam out of the cannula and back into the reservoir so that because remember the fda's biggest fear here is that you fail open because there's no coming back from that so we have eight families of patents around the way that we pump insulin. You can't patent pumping insulin anymore, but you can patent certain features around the way you pump insulin. So we have a great IP moat around this. We have, and we've spent over $50 million developing it and getting this product to this point. Um, but we have another advantage. Because we weren't designed in 1996, 2001, or 2007, we have access to componentry that just didn't exist back when the other pumps were designed. And in fact... Paul, when he had our engineers working on this product, told them, you don't get to use it unless it, in terms of, uh, in terms of the electronic components, unless it comes from another industry. Okay. So we benefit from the scale of the supply chain of cell phones and drones, the most optimized electronic supply chain the world has ever seen. Even though the other guys are doing a billion in revenue, they're doing a billion in revenue in what's essentially a Rolex, a bespoke custom medical device for medically designed component from many, many years ago. We're basically pumping with a Casio. And because of that, I can make this claim at the bottom. Between that and reusing the electronics, we are 50% lower cost of goods at scale than the leading patch pump, the insulin Omnipod. This is more on the exact same point, right? On the left is the insulin Omnipod. That's a cross section. It's got 75 discrete components, some analog, some digital. Some are still put in place with tweezers. Some are put in place with automation. On the right is our product are disposable, 12 molded plastic pieces in a coin cell battery designed from the ground up to be lights out, automated manufacturing. And the automation alone for the Omnipod's last facility cost $65 million. A line, our first line that can do, you know, on three shifts can do something like 60 or $70 million in revs at okay gross margins, $6 million in CapEx. We have a huge advantage in terms of capital expenditure. And if I add another $18 million, I can do a couple hundred million on that line. So more capital efficient, easier to use, scalable. None of that matters if you don't have a differentiated way to go to market. And the way these products are sold shocked me when I learned about it. So right now you go to your endocrinologist and you say, I want to go on a pump. The endo says, that's great. Keep a diary for 60 days of all your diabetic all your diabetic events. And they're not saying that because you're a good or a bad candidate clinically. Everyone's a good candidate clinically. They're saying that as a pure proxy for compliance because they're afraid of the $4,000 paperweight problem. At the end of the 60 days, you turn in your diary and they say, congratulations, you're eligible for a pump. Here are the business cards for Insulate, Tandem, and Medtronic. Call them and they'll come to your house. And so they literally roll a $200,000 a year rep to your house to do a feature and benefit sale at the kitchen table as to why you should pick their pump. And at the end of that, and then they leave with the product because if they leave you with it, because of the way they're designed, either they'll leave you with a $4,000 medical device that you might not bring back, or, or they'll leave you with something that you could potentially self-fill without having the multiple days of instruction that are required to use it, given that, you know, the leading pumps have 12 to 1300 user configurable features. And if you configure it wrong, you die. Um, and so they don't want to take the risk. So then you have to go back to the nurse diabetes educator and they help drive the pump decision and help you decide which pump is right for you or is none of the current pumps right for you. So we think that our initial targeting is one, we did a survey of 30 multiple daily injectors and we said, we gave them our quick start guide, our reusable, and we gave them a, uh, a dummy cartridge and we said, what is this and what will you do with it? Eight out of 10 could put it on correctly in less than 10 minutes and said, it's a pump, obviously. Like our pump has fundamentally four configurations, not 1300. It's designed to be learned to use in 20 minutes. And that's unheard of in this space. And because of our cost advantage, we're going to offer first month free. We're going to offer copay buy downs and we're going to be easy to train which is a huge reduction in burden. So one, we want to be the fourth option on the table next to the big three. Two, 
There are only 4,000 endocrinologists in the United States who see patients. Of those, only 1,500 have ever written a pump in the 30 years that pumps have been on, a market, on the market. Of those 1,500, 80% of the pump scripts come from 1,000 of them, and they're attached five to 10 at a time, those 1,000, to a single nurse diabetes educator training practice in their area who specializes in teaching people how to use pumps. Those are the practices we have to capture, and there are only a couple hundred of them. And we can go after the 2,500 endos who look at the current products and say, I'm never writing that. It's too much work. It's not worth it for me. So, so I think we, off, so we offer an advantage for the doctors. We offer an advantage for the patients in terms of ease of use. We offer the ability to try it easily. We offer a lower training burden rather than days or, or a full week. We offer you the ability to learn this in 20 minutes. Or, you know, if someone has a flip phone, go ahead, take it home, try it. The risk to you is you, we might lose a free sample. That's it. That's unheard of in this space. Okay, what about the insurance companies? So we surveyed a third of the commercial lives in the US and we said, you know, we want to be on the prescription drug benefit because one of Insulate's big, and this is an Insulate Omnipod, by the way, one of Insulate's big innovations is that they've gone on the they've gone and gotten on the prescription drug benefit. They eat the cost of their second handset by marking up the monthly um, the monthly dollars they get for giving you 10 of these. And they, so the insurance companies love that. They love it so much they're willing to pay $1,000 more a year for insulate than they are for the other devices because they don't have that upfront risk of the $4,000 paperweight. So we surveyed a third of the commercial lives in the US and we said, what percentage, what rebate do we have to pay you in order to be equal or preferred to insulate day one? And they said, well, better be 10 or 20%. So all my numbers assume a 20% rebate. That's $1,000 a year savings versus insulate. They're not taking the upfront risk. And there's no there's no reason the patient has to be out of pocket massively in order to try our product. And we can be equal or preferred day one. Anytime you hear about someone giving away something for free, it should make you nervous, but we have great unit economics. At scale, and obviously the first couple thousand we make, we're attaching $20 bills to them. But at scale, we have gross margins in the high 70s. Those are great numbers. And we have great net margins too, because we don't require the huge direct sales force. What does this enable? A business model where if we get 1% share, 36,000 users, we have 150 million in revs and we're profitable. 2% share, 300 million in revs, and we have a 20% operating margin. Insulate barely makes money at 1.2 billion in revs. Tandem doesn't make money at a billion in revs. I don't think they can cut the price to compete with us. And we're not going after their customers anywhere. We're going after people who have said no to them for a long, long time. How are we going to get cleared? Well, we submitted to the FDA in January. The, the device, predicate device pathway is quite different from the drug process, if you're familiar with it. So January 19th, we submitted. We got They owe us questions within 60 days. We got them on March 15th. We have 180 days maximum to respond to them or we time out. So we're working on our response right now. And so, Gab, sorry. Yeah. So you submitted your application, they yes. reviewed it, and then they've given you a list of questions to respond off your initial Correct. Correct. Uh, and, application. And now you've got yes. 180 days to reply to the FDA. Or less. Yes, we can or, come back. Yeah. And, and, and to be clear, we're a predicate device submission. So this is not like a drug submission where they can say, oh, I want you to enroll another 500 patients. Remember, no human trial except for usability. And they want... They have to, their questions have to be about how we are or aren't equivalent to this, our predicate device, which is the tandem T Slim that our founder invented and got through the FDA. There's very little we don't know about this device. So we have to be equivalent to something he designed in 2007 and got cleared in 2010. So, so we have 180 days to respond to their questions. We're in the process of getting ready to, of responding to their questions. And you know, I'm not going to say that it's going to take 30 days because it's already taken more than 30 days, but I'm also going to say that it's likely it probably won't take the full 180 either. After we respond to them, then they have 30 days to give us a second set of questions. Then we have another 180 days to respond to those questions, max. After we respond to that second set of questions, we're, uh, we're supposed to go interactive, which means that we talk to them on a daily or weekly basis to clear us with the least commercial burden possible for us as a company. The average time for clearance for an insulin carrying device in this division of the FDA for a predicate application has been 159 days the last two years. Are we average? We are, I suspect we are significantly worse than average because that average includes things that are as simple as an auto injector pen with no electronics on it on board at all. But 
that at least gives you some idea that it's not, you know, this isn't a three year process in front of the agency unless unless they have major, major issues with something that we've done. So that's the FDA process. Um, we'll skip over the product roadmap because I don't want to bore people. There's a big opportunity in Europe where pumps are grossly underpenetrated, which we can address later. Um, why should you believe anything that I'm saying? <laughs> Good question. All right. So Philips Medicize is our manufacturing partner. They are a $4 billion annual revenue uh, contract manufacturer for medical products. They've spent more than two years helping us design this product. All our manufacturing partners are validated Philips Medicize suppliers. I don't think they would have spent this much time and effort on us if they thought that this was going to be a $3 million a year kind of product. That would have been a terrible misuse of their resources. So that's a nice validator. The former CEO of Insulet, who actually launched the Omni Insulet Omnipod, um, joined our board last July. So I think you know he sees something very differentiated in what we do versus Insulet. And Gluco is the leading provider of upload, download, patient reporting software in the doctor's office. And we are paying them. But once again, they're not going to just partner with any rank startup. They have to dedicate engineering resources to putting us on their platform. How could you make money on this? Well, and what's it worth? So um, in December of 2022, Tandem Diabetes bought a company called AMF Siggy for $70 million in cash and $140 million in earnouts and milestones. On the call, they said that they were planning to file this product with the agency in early 2027. So they're four plus years behind us. And yet they have a high, they they got a higher upfront than we did. Um Medtronic last May announced that they were going, they were trying to buy a company called EOFlow out of Korea. EOFlow was cleared in Korea, cleared in Europe, had less than 5,000 users ever, and um, Medtronic was going to pay $740 million in cash for it. In August, Insulet sued them for patent infringement and trade secret theft because they said, you know, this product is an Insulet Omnipod, essentially. And you've spent less than $15 million on it. This is directly out of their complaint. And in fact, 65% of the componentry in their device is identical to this, including it's the same color molded plastic. And so in December, Medtronic walked away from the deal. I'm not saying that Medtronic is going to buy us. I'm just going to say that as a comp for how much is a not yet cleared, very late stage insulin pump worth um, to one of the existing players or a new entrant, well, Medtronic was willing to pay $740 million for EO flow. And our current valuation is more like 50. So there's a substantial spread between 50 and 740. Uh, in order to make any progress here, you've got to trust that there's a good team here. So I'm a, I'm a hedge fund manager by trade. I'm also the PM of the largest shareholder of Modular Medical. So I'm touting my own book, but I'm also eating my own cooking because I make a dollar a year in salary working at this company in addition to continuing to run the portfolio. Uh, Paul DePerna, as you know, founded Tandem Diabetes and got the T-Slim cleared. Um, our COO, Kevin Schmidt, came from, ins you know, was at Insulate and built their first two facilities. So he knows how to ramp up patch pump manufacturing quite well. And we just hired a new VP of, manu of uh, engineering, Steve Gemmel, who was head of R&D for Insulate for five years and worked it on Duo, which is uh, Google and Sanofi's diabetes related health startup so his job is to integrate us with all the other devices in diabetes land so we've got a really good team from you know not a bunch of 25 year olds from stanford who say oh i could figure out how to do this and we have a pretty simple cap structure too 31 million shares out uh 1.3 million penny warrants owned by a single investor uh who paid 374 for those warrants so that's just a filing thing uh 5.1 million warrants at a buck 22 and a bunch of warrants up at $6.60. And that's it. Um, so hopefully I didn't take too much time rocking and rolling through that. No, that was good. Since we're on the cap uh, table here, you just raised uh, some money. Could you tell yes. us about that raise and how much of a runway does that give you? How much of a sort of financing risk is potentially on the, the uh, for uh, shareholders at this point? Great question. So we raised $11 million in February with uh, Titan Partners. Uh, that was a pure common share deal done at $1.10. It was three times oversubscribed. And I would say the and Manchester, my fund, took 10% of the deal. We would have taken more, but uh, the NASDAQ said it's not an arm's length deal if you take more than 10%, given that you're clearly an affiliate. So this is where we ended up. 
So we had, you know, good list of institutions, existing shareholders, new shareholders, et cetera. Um, we feel that that money gives us, should give us enough runway to get cleared by the FDA. We have substantial control over our burn rate at this point. We can, uh, you know, our base burn is about half a million dollars a month, but then we're choosing to spend more one to stand up the European clearance process where we see big opportunities for a cost safe product like ours. And, uh, and we want to make sure that our manufacturing is in a good position because we think, you know, we're going to look cards on the table. I'm totally agnostic as to how this all plays out. If a strategic wants to take us out upon clearance, we're happy to pursue that. If the price is right, if we have to get a few thousand users, or if we have to run this thing, run this all the way through, we're happy to do that too. So, um, you know, I think we have the resources to be flexible about that. So if you see us spending money on manufacturing and other things that might be post-clearance related, I think an acquirer might value us doing things that will enhance our margins and our volumes out of the gate. And we would value that too. So I think that's our best expenditure of money relative to hiring salespeople who an acquirer would have to get rid of. Yeah. And then it gives you the, you're obviously setting yourself up for as many options as possible. So if you don't like the the, if there is a, a bid for you, then you can say, look, we've got other, we're, we're, we're going down the commercialization path yourself and you have to sweeten up or else we, we've got a good path here as well. It puts you in a much stronger uh, negotiating uh, bargaining position. I, I Look, don't take the fact that we're willing, that we're logical and rational stewards of capital who are not afraid to take, take the right risk reward for the shareholders is any sign that we're afraid to launch this product ourselves. I got a question here from the audience. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the recent hire of VP of Engineering? What will he work on? Was he brought on to help with the FDA process? He's mainly not brought on to help with the FDA process. His his expertise is in you know he did the integration for Insulate with uh, with Dexcom and Abbott. Uh, he was head of device at Onduo, where he did integration between CGMs, pumps etc so phone integration advanced you know automated insulin delivery etc that's his expertise so um i would say he's broadly there to help with our feature set after we get cleared so that we're not seen as because and and, and you know this dovetails really nicely with another question with another obvious question which is did you dumb down the interface because your product is much less capable and the answer is this package is just as capable as all the other pumps in terms of accuracy. It has Bluetooth, it has NFC, it has all the processing power that the other products have. It's got, it's got a great form factor, but it's got everything that they, they have in terms of being able to serve the high end of the market. But we've chosen to make the interface easy in order to easier to use in order to go after a differentiated set of customers who might not want the super complex interface. But there's absolutely no reason that we can't be in the high end of the market if we want to be. And so Steve is to, there to make sure that there's that there's a migration path for someone who wants a more sophisticated experience, but wants to stay on our product or wants to integrate with whatever other devices they happen to be wearing, that there is a path for them and that there is a comfort level for them. And I'll also <laughs> say, look, he's an extremely experienced guy and he joined us after the FDA question. So you know, you can, you might take that as an indication that he, he felt comfortable joining us as a full-time employee, having, having had some awareness of what the FDA asked us about. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause I was just looking his, um, you, you issued the news release, uh, for him at the end of March. And that was after you received the question. So he must be clearly comfortable with where you're at, the types of questions, uh, cause the types of questions they have is indicative of, sort of where they're leaning and you can't share that with us but you get a sense of if they're they're sort of nasty questions or sort of constructive questions i guess uh, i think i think you get a pretty good sense from the first set but you're gonna have a really good sense from that second set okay i, I think uh you know like i think that it's um you know we didn't put out a press release about the questions because i don't want to say anything that's pejorative for the FDA or for our reviewers, but I'll just say that they met their timeline for getting us questions. And I've had people ask me like, well, did you get 200 questions or one? Well, 
it doesn't really matter if you get one question you can't answer you're kind of you're kind of sol and if you get 200 questions that are all like where where do i find this table you have nothing to worry about and the answer is the answer is you usually fall somewhere in the middle <laughs> all right there there is a question here just pop, popped up is where did the how did the these questions come in respect to your expectations of the questions were they harder or easier or are they kind of in line with uh, the types of questions you were expecting? Or can you comment? Within, within the range of our expectations is what I would say. So in the meantime, you're you're working diligently, your team, I, I presume, uh, answering the questions, getting the information together. I, 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 whenever I look at investments, I try to look at sort of scenario analysis. Like what what's sort of a bad case scenario? They give some nasty questions or they say no or... Or what, 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 what can you map out some sort of challenging pathways that if things don't go as swimmingly well as they seem to be going? So, in the predicate device pathway, remember, they don't just get to say, I don't like it. No, it has to, there has to be a why. Why are you not equivalent to something that's already on the market right now, which in this case is the tandem T slip? So they would have to say, we're not convinced that you're not as safe. You're not, you're not as accurate as the tandem T slip. Or we're not convinced that, you know, your reliability is as good, or we're not convinced that users can figure out how to use your product, or or we're not convinced do more work to prove that it's usable, right? Do more work to, you know, like, or, or you know, I mean, they, it's it's any number of things that they could go after. But remember, we, we had a pre-sub meeting with them where they told us what their general questions were going to be. And then we had multiple other pre-sub meetings where we asked in detail about certain areas where we wanted to make sure that we understood exactly what they wanted. Um, so this is a much more collaborative process than the drug process where you kind of go away and then they come back after nine or 12 months. And they're like, oh, here you go. <laughs> this is this is what we think. And and so I think it's broadly understood what it takes to get cleared in this space. But that doesn't mean it's easy because yeah. pumping insulin is really, really hard. And as a for instance, there were three pumps that between 2011 and 2021 that were very well funded that tried to come to market, but all of them started from the place of, I think the reason that people aren't on these products is that they want a beautiful iPhone style interface in order to work with the device. And then, oh, by the way, I guess we have to pump insulin. <laughs> and they pre they all pressurized the reservoir, both to save space and uh, on, on their device and to overcome a weaker pumping mechanism. And the FDA was never comfortable with that. Like when you hear pressurized, well, prove to me, what imagine a question that might be like prove to me that this can't fail open that's i mean and honestly we stand on their shoulders right we we consulted with a lot of the people who used to work for them in regulatory to understand what went wrong and that's yeah. part of the reason that our product is architected the way it is to try and address some of the agency's questions that they've had over the last 12 years about other products that people have tried to bring to market yeah this is a bit of a leading uh question but i i would think as well the fda sees the the need for having more given the health benefits of having continuous pumping uh that this is a product inherently they would want on the market that addresses a, a large unmet need and they as opposed to something worth mere let's say uh not as clear a benefit so in a sense they would maybe want to like obviously they can't put risk out into the market for millions of patients but this is something that would do good. So maybe they would try to hopefully get it cleared if it's safe. Uh, so I'm going to answer that two different ways. Yeah. Uh, and they're both going to sound somewhat oblique, but but bear with me for one second. Um, so first of all, the FDA cleared a product last year in May by a company called Beta Bionics. So the Beta Bionics device looks a lot like this, which is the current, which is the 670G, the current mini med. So it's got a... It needs to be used with a CGM. It's a tube-based pump, so you have to wear it on your belt or on your thigh or in your pocket with 48 inches of tubing that goes into your abdomen. Um, so we don't think it's a optimized form factor, frankly. Like they started from the place of we want to auto we want to make automated insulin delivery easier working with a CGM rather than we want to make the form factor better. <laughs> Okay. And sorry, CGM continuous glucose monitor. Glucose so monitor. it responds to what your glucose is and possibly and then the, AI, the algorithm tries to adjust as well to that. Gotcha. And so so their device, um, 
and they'll freely admit this, their eyelid algorithm for automated insulin delivery is the least, least accurate automated insulin delivery algorithm on the market. Uh, pretty, you know, reasonably substantially, but it's much easier to use in that you don't announce sleep exercise and you just say small, medium, large when you see a meal and you enter your weight. The FDA considered that to be enough of a benefit that they put out their own press release about when they cleared the product, despite the fact that it was a less accurate algorithm. So that should give you a pretty good indication as to where their head is at in terms of ease of use is a major benefit. And the other thing I'll say about the FDA and their current attitude towards ease of use in general is it, it's, not a, it's not definitive yet. But in October of 22, the FDA put out new breakthrough device guidance, draft guidance for people to comment on and still in the comment period, who knows when it's going to eventually be cleared, but where they say breakthrough device could also be defined by accessibility and ease of use. And ease of use in this case might be English isn't your first language. It might be that you have dexterity issues. It might be that you have a hard time reading the instructions. It might be that you're not that tech savvy. It might be that you don't have great insurance, but that all fell in the department of Ex accessibility. So they think, they think that's important enough to have that be a qualifier for breakthrough status. Um, so once again, we can't take advantage of that right now, but and, and frankly, we're already in front of the agency, so it wouldn't be that much of an advantage at this point. But it does tell you which way the wind is blowing in terms of the agency thinking, understanding that as a broad category of devices, more penetration of things that save the system money and offer people better care if it means if as long as they're easy to use is important. Can we circle back to the timeline again, just to make because they're. The, you, there are the questions, you you give your answer, uh, then there they give their answer, and then you've got another 180 days. Can you, so like, I, I guess, what is the soonest that it could practically be cleared and what's sort of at the long, the tail end of uh, how long things could take to get cleared? If we don't answer this first set of questions by September 11th, we're, uh, we're going back to, we're going back to square one. Okay. So that's, I mean, I can't be any clearer than that. <laughs> as far as yeah. that. And then once, once we make that first, once we get that response and they owe us that next set of questions in 30 days, 30 yeah. calendar days. So at that point, then there's a second 180 day clock that starts and how fast we can respond to that. I mean, I really, I couldn't yeah. even be, comment on that because I have no idea what the questions are going to be. They could yeah. be, could be a shorter list because clearly they only get half as much time to come up with them, but they could yeah. be. They could be harder because they're a lot more specific. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and look, some time is not necessarily correlated with difficulty. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important to understand is that there is some sometimes if I ask you to do a test on a product, a further test on a product, but I require you to do certain things to that product before you test it again. And those things take a given amount of time and there's no way to do them faster. That doesn't mean that the test is harder. It just means that it takes time to condition the products in order to do said test. And there, and look, there are tests that don't take very long at all. That could be that could expose major flaws and weaknesses in your product. So, so uh, now, flip side of that, there are certain tests that take longer and represent major issues if you if you struggle with them. Right? Like, remember, we we were delayed submitting our our product to the agency for an extended period of time because we had what's called an insulin stability problem, which was um, the insulin stability test is really simple. It's, uh, you know, you put you put 30 vials in a beaker at room temperature, and then you pump, uh, you pump insulin through your product, 30 of your pumps, and then you compare them and you have to be within 5% in terms of the intact insulin molecules at the end. If you aren't, if this is like a, you aren't tall enough to be on the carnival ride. If you yeah. aren't, like there's no gold star for being 99. There's no C minus for being 95.1. It just has to be above 95. Okay. Yeah. And so that we had a we had a materials compatibility issue that made that made us consistently hit like 92, 93. And it took us quite a while to figure out what was causing that problem. But that's that's the kind of thing that can take quite a while to solve where you run a real risk of timing out. Yeah. So some things take longer to solve, other things don't take long to solve. Other things could be quite straightforward and very quick yeah. and then other things might take a while but don't represent a ton of risk i know that's that's a fairly oblique answer but the answer but the answer in this process is it just depends 
why was the equity raise done at such a low price if it was three times oversubscribed? Uh, well, that was the trailing three-day VWAP. And the orders were, a lot of the orders were contingent on, I want to be at market three-day trailing VWAP. And that's where the stock was trading for three days. I mean, I, and it didn't help that the Russell was down 9% in the two days before the deal was priced. Yeah. Uh, it didn't, you know, and and inherently, whenever you have a, a direct deal like this and you're marketing for a few days, then you run the risk that you take buyers out of the market. Yep. And, and the market was soft. Uh, but on the flip side, no warrants. Oh, I should also say the warrants that we do have are not exploding warrants. They don't have resets. They're all cash. It's they're very, you know, it's it's very it's a fairly clean capital structure as yeah. far as that goes. So so that's so that's what happened. Um, you know, the stock was under pressure. Um, you know, we didn't yeah. have we clearly didn't have, you know, I think, uh, you know, we also have an ATM with Lyric, uh that we put in place in November, um, you know. Obviously, if if the stock had had an enormous spike after we submitted to the FDA, maybe I would have taken more more money off the Lyric ATM. But uh, you know, the market we traded two hundred fifty thousand shares after we submitted, and that that wasn't enough. That wasn't yeah. enough for us to feel comfortable. Yeah, yeah. All right, and then that's just one risk you've gotten off the table. Now you you've got a nice uh, yeah. runway. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think ahead. I think we'll 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 reactivate the ATM in terms of having it out there. But I don't have you know we have plenty of capital right now. I don't have any desire to sell stock down here. It's just yeah. good house good housekeeping in case you know, in case something like when we when we announced Philips Medicize, the stock traded fifteen million shares, um, in a day. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think as a management team, it's just good housekeeping to have, have that optionality available if the price is right, but yeah. right now the price is most certainly not right. And I can say that as a shareholder whose whole incentive in this company is oriented around the equity, I'm not going to do something to dilute myself just to make more money, just to make more salary because there is no salary for me. <laughs> yeah. In terms of news flow coming out, I, I presume you'll issue a news release when you saying we've responded to the FDA or what other types of news flow items should investors be looking out for to see that sort of things are progressing and, and milestones are being hit? Um, well, the, what I'll say about putting out a press release or an 8K about responding to questions is you won't see a lot of companies or any companies that I know of in the medical device space doing that because that can only go badly for you in terms of uh, your relationship with the FDA. When we when we received the questions, all we did was we took the deck that was on our website and we put this checkbox right here with a date. And yeah. I think when we respond to the questions, we're going to do the same thing. As far as news flow goes, you know, I think you'll see us start to work on the European process. There might be some news related to that because, you know, in Europe, the high, most, highest penetrated market is Germany at like 14 percent. Europe, uh, the UK is like five. France is mid, mid to low single digits, too. Um, we think there's a lot of opportunity given the socialized me medical systems for uh, a product like ours. Um where we don't have to invest in a big sales force because ultimately it's the government who tenders for it and then we sell them a product. And they know there's a long-term benefit to our product, but they've been unwilling in general to invest in the high upfront costs related to our competitors. So there's the European stuff. Um, there might be some more key hires that we can put in place as we as we get close as we get further along. And um, you know. As I said, if you if you see us spending money on manufacturing, that's meant to that's both something that we see benefit in both if we're independent or not independent in terms of uh, in terms of value and getting a multiple, and also a sign that we're willing to shorten our runway a little bit because we're feeling comfortable with the FDA process. All right, let's say when you or if you or if when you get your approval what happens at that point how long does it take for you to i guess hire the commercialization team are you going to hire any of the commercialization team prior to fda approval and then when would revenues start uh kicking in great question okay so and i'm glad you asked this because this is an important clarification point so remember in the FDA process, once you finish, when you get that letter saying that you're cleared, your product has never been worn in a real world environment delivering insulin ever. That's illegal. <laughs> so, so you, 
unless you want things to go very badly for you in the real world, you pretty much have to run a soft launch of, you know, 60 to 90 days where you put it on a few hundred people and with a couple of friendly doctors to make sure that your usability manual is just right, that your button has exactly the right clickiness, that your adhesive has the right stickiness, all things that don't re necessarily require a retest with the FDA, but that are just important for making good impression with consumers to make sure that you haven't missed something that could be really important for a certain group of users, right? So in that soft launch period, that's when we would go and hire a commercial team. Okay. Not before then. Not before yeah. then. The things that I want to spend money on are the things that we're, are going to get me a multiple no matter what happens, which are manufacturing improvements, integration with other devices, and uh, like what Steve is working on and working on getting clearances overseas as well as in the States. All right. All right. And your commercialization process, if you, you don't get taken out, you hire a bunch of salespeople and then you, you, you've you got a list of the endocrinologists that they would target and the key nurse opinion leaders have, for fitting and so forth? Or Yeah. So we have obviously there are the roughly 200 nurse diabetes educator practices, which are very high volume where we want to be that fourth choice on the table. Um, you know, I think that it's there are many, and obviously more than half of endocrinologists have never written a pump script. So, so that's that's a big, it's not that hard to find endos who might see an opportunity in that, especially since there are now these new reimbursement rules that you can uh, you can make, uh, if you stack four different codes together, you can make $200 a month doing monitoring of wearable diabetes devices. Um, so for an, endo an endocrinologist are actually grossly underpaid as a specialty. They make 115 grand a year. On average, they're like derms without Botox. Um, they're so they um, they tend to be older. They tend to be frankly less entrepreneurial. All they have are office visits and lab tests. So two hundred dollars for an hour for less than an hour of work might not sound like a lot to you, but I assure you that that is motivating for an endocrinologist or a nurse diabetes educator. Um, and there's also potential training revenue if you can actually teach someone how to use one of these products in 20 minutes because there's a $50 code that nobody uses because it takes days to teach people how to use an insulin pump, not minutes, okay? Yeah. So so there are additional revenue opportunities that will drive things, but I still think not selling direct to the patients and going the sample route like everyone else, everywhere else in medicine does allows us to be much more scalable because we only need a 20 to 25 person direct sales force and then associated supporting staff. We can also use distributors because there are a lot of distributors in this space. And actually that number of distributors is growing dramatically as more and more as the home oxygen business reimbursement keeps getting cut and people keep moving over from oxygen to uh, diabetes supplies. So, right. so look, I think, I think there, there's the go it alone and do everything yourself model. There's a hybrid model where you use distributors and direct salespeople. There's a model where you go heavier on the distributors. There's a model where you go aggressively after overseas once you're cleared there, which should probably be about six, you know, the, the European process is about 12 months. So it'll probably be like six months behind the U.S. process. Um, there's a model where you go heavily into that because you don't have to build a sales force there. Um, so, I mean, these are these are all high class problems to have. And, and the one thing I'll say about and, and, you know, I don't want to invest a lot of money in those things before we get cleared because our cost of capital right now, frankly, I view is quite high. And and there's never been a pump company that was cleared in the public market. And that this isn't a very big end, but this is just a fact that didn't achieve a three hundred million dollar market cap after clearance. Even right. pretty early on, like in, the Insulate Omni, Insulate got a, they had a $330 million valuation after they got cleared five years before they got on the right reimbursement benefit. And they only had 2 million in revs and a negative gross margin. Tandem, when they got cleared, it's doing less than 20 million in revs, $480 million market cap. And then they were out in the wilderness for another four years trying to compete with Medtronic head to head, to head at the kitchen table before Medtronic had a recall and J&J &J got out of the business. And they got their they got those customers basically. Uh, I think we've covered the the main topics, and we should probably start wrapping things up here. Is there anything you want to highlight before we? Uh, do you want to put a bow on it, so to speak, before we wrap things up? I'll I'll just say that you know, one, we're in the midst of the FDA process. You know, we're going to be 
con we're constantly evaluating how to maximize shareholder value. And, you know, there's no one sitting at the table here who doesn't have that as their as their guiding light. You know, Paul's not one of these scientific founders who thinks this is the only good idea he's ever going to have. He did Tandem. He did this other company, Ivera Medical, which was sold to 3M right after clearance. Uh, has nothing to do with diabetes. But, um, you know, obviously, I'm a hedge fund guy. I'm, you know, I'd like to be on the other side of the Zoom at some point again, not <laughs> on this side. And so, you know, look, I... I think we're going to do what's right for the shareholders and we're not afraid to commercialize. We're not afraid to do something in the middle. And we're also not afraid to find the right home for this because we think that this would be very accretive for anyone else in this space. Jeb, thank you very much. I really appreciate the time. I appreciate you uh, pitching us the story and walking through it all. Uh, uh, all, can, all the best. Uh, good luck on all this. And I'd love to have you back as we hit some more milestones. We can maybe talk about how things are progressing. That sounds great, Martin. Thank you for having me. All right. Cheers. Have a great day.